Hi, uh, good morning. Um, thank you for coming today. I know uh, the uh, people start to get sessioned out about uh, this time in the conference like this, so uh, glad to see some, some faces here. Um, my name's Tony Irwin. Um, I'm going to uh, talk today about some work we've done um, with our Node.js microservice system uh, to do some monitoring um, with open source tools. Um, all of our microservices are Node.js, um, which is why it's in this track. Um, basically an overview of what we'll talk about. Um, some of you may have seen my presentation yesterday as well, but um, give an introduction to the Bluemix UI, which is the, uh, the Cloud Foundry microservice system I work on, um, and its architecture just very quickly um, to review that. Um, importance of monitoring a microservice system. You know, one of the first things we, we learned as we started migrating to a microservice system is, is, is monitoring is just super important, and I think we uh, probably underestimated that when we started. Um, I want to give an overview of the monitoring architecture um, that we set up, as well as some examples of actually using uh, the monitoring data to do some uh, problem analysis. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, how you should go about building your own monitoring system, and then a quick word at the end about uh, uh, synthetic measurements. Um, so the Bluemix UI, um, as I alluded to, is the, the front end to uh, IBM's open cloud platform. It's a pretty large um, UI. Um, it's made up of about uh, 25 microservices at this point. Um, it lets users uh, view and manage um, Cloud Foundry resources, apps and services, orgs and spaces, as well as you know, other uh, resource types like containers and virtual servers and such. And it runs within uh, IBM's Cloud Foundry deployment within uh, Bluemix product and just a couple uh, small screenshots there at the bottom. Um, the Bluemix UI architecture, as I've alluded to, is a microservice architecture. Um, if you were here yesterday, you saw this same diagram. Um, we started off as a monolithic application, a single Java backend um, serving a single page app using uh, do the Dojo JavaScript framework. Um, over the last couple years, we've uh, most more or less gotten rid of the Java app and have, like I said, about 25 to 30 um, Node.js microservices. I'll say a few words about the importance of monitoring. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of you have products in production and you may <laughs> have also run into similar uh, issues where a you know, problem occurs in the middle of the night. Um, you know, what do we do? Um, so I think there are at least three big areas where it's important to have monitoring. Um, one is for root cause analysis. Um, the Bluemix UI is the, the most visible part of the Bluemix platform probably just because it's the, the front end. And it, it kind of acts as a, a canary in the mine shaft for the whole platform because we, we end up calling you know, APIs across the board. We touch nearly every component. and you know, if you've ever worked on UIs, you know that uh, you're the first line of defense anyways <laughs> when a problem occurs. And so we, you know, when a critical event or an outage occurs, uh, it often starts with console is down, console is slow, I can't log into console. Um, it may or may not actually be um, a console uh, code problem. Um, it may, it, in some cases it has been, um, but it could also be a networking issue or a firewall issue or uh, Cloud Foundry could be uh, struggling at any given time. So, you know, when we at 2 a.m. and uh, you get a pager duty <laughs> that there's a problem, it's almost a matter of self-preservation to be able to quickly do um, some root cause analysis and monitoring um, allows you to do that or helps you to do that. Um, ideally, um, you'd like to be able to auto-detect problems. Um, with a, with a monitoring system. So you don't want to wait necessarily <laughs> until a user or a support person uh, calls you up. It's nice if you can, by looking at the data, see that an API, for example, that started returning a bunch of errors. Well, let's just go ahead and send an alert to the team um, to do investigation before a, a user hits the problem. And another big reason to have monitoring is you really can't improve things uh, that you can't measure and track over time. So if you know, if you have certain performance goals or, or uh, quality goals, if you 
don't know what you're currently hitting, you, you can't really <laughs> uh, do much to improve it. Or you don't know if you're improving it or making it worse. Um, the kinds of uh, metrics we were especially interested in when we started uh, working on this um, was so if, with all of our microservices, we wanted to have information about every inbound and outbound uh, request. Inbound request being a, a call into the microservice, an outbound request being uh, calling an API um, that's outside of the microservice. Um, so we wanted to get things like response time, uh, error codes, um, uh, the HTTP method, et cetera, so the kinds of things you would normally uh, see on a request. Um, we were also interested in you know, lower level details about you know, memory usage, CPU usage of our apps, um, as well as you know, uh, app crashes. You know, that's a signal of a problem if your app is crashing. Um, and then finally, general health of, of our uh, general ecosystem and dependencies. Uh, for example, uh, we have a shared Redis um, session across our microservices. And if we can't connect to Redis, then we're in trouble. So you know, we do some monitoring to make sure we are, we're able to connect and get the stuff we need out of Redis and send alerts if, if that um, starts to fail. Uh, so this is a, a diagram of our uh, monitoring architecture. Um, at the top, it's similar to the previous diagram in some ways and then it shows the Bluemix UI client, which is the web browser. Um, the, the proxy layer, all requests come into the proxy, um, which are then routed to um, those green boxes are supposed to represent um, microservices um, in, the, in the UI that make up the UI. And so requests from the proxy uh, are routed to those microservices appropriately. Um, but then what I've added here is uh, some blue boxes at the bottom, which are some additional apps we've added just dedicated to monitoring. And I've also added um, some lines from the, as you can see my cursor a little bit, the, uh, these lines from the proxy and, and out from these microservices um, that go to MQTT. So we've, we've added a piece of middleware um, to all of our uh, microservices. So as requests come in and go out, we're publishing um, events to uh, MQTT uh, message queue, which is backed by the IBM Internet of Things. Um, I guess there was a presentation on, on cat detection yesterday that, that talked about uh, this as well. Um, I don't have anything as cool as cats in this presentation, but. Um, so, so everything goes through MQTT, and then uh, these orange lines coming out of the MQTT represent cases where our monitoring apps are subscribing to the events. Um, so all of our microservices publish events to MQTT, then we have other, a couple other apps that are subscribing to those events. And uh, our monitor storage box down here, its responsibility is to uh, get those events, it does some massaging of the data, and then stores them in InfluxDB. Um, so that we have a, a persistent record of what's happening. And then uh, you know, over here to the far right side, uh, we have Grafana, um, which is, connects to our InfluxDB, so we can see all this data in real time. Um, we also have a, uh, an alerting app or microservice that's similarly subscribing to MQTT, um, and it does some analysis. It, it, it tracks some numbers over time and will actually send uh, you know, put post into Slack or send pager duty alerts if it starts to detect anomalies. And we also have this uh, third app that I put into our monitoring category, which, which we call a space scanner, which is really just using Cloud Foundry APIs um, to kind of keep track of memory, CPU usage of all of our instances, as well as, you know, looks at the app events and sees if there's been crashes, um, those sorts of things. And this is a, a textual view <laughs> of, of that diagram, so I'm not gonna read that uh, to you here, but um, if you want a reference later. So using monitoring data, so, so we're putting all this data into InfluxDB, and we've connected uh, Grafana to it so we can look at it later. Um, so we, we have a lot of, uh, if you're familiar, I don't know, if you're, you know how many people are familiar with Grafana, um, but it's an open source tool that allows you to create custom dashboards to 
pull data from, from various data sources. Um, we have a lot of dashboards um, that are like the one uh, shown here. Um, th this happens to be uh, real data from our, our proxy microservice um, over, I don't know, I think it's over about a 12 hour period or so. Um, it includes things like total requests, so they're that top chart. It's probably a little bit hard to read, but um, where all the green is would be uh, good requests. There's, uh, it's actually color coded, so you might see a little bit of yellow and potentially red um, if we get 400 or 500 responses. Um, but most of it's green, so that's good in this case. Um, the second chart is uh, overall response time. Um, we include mean, median, 90% uh, time. Uh, we, we think 90% time, or 90, some people use 95%, um, is important because you know, sometimes you're, you know, your average looks okay, but you're getting these spikes along the way. Um, so some people are getting slow responses that you would like to sort of uh, knock out of the system. And the third chart we show here is error rate. Um, so the number of uh, 400 errors and 500 errors coming through. You know, we have a little steady stream of those. Some, you know, sometimes 400 errors are just, you know, some some bot <laughs> on the internet or old bookmarks and things that don't, you know, map um, to you know something we currently have. Um, some 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 of our APIs return 400 errors as uh, just per their spec. Um, so 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 seeing some yellow there isn't always a bad thing. So uh, you know, I often make the analogy to like a cardiologist um, reading echocardiograms um, or an EKG, you know, can look at that and see, oh, you've had a heart attack, um, whereas most of us pick that up and it's like, you know, I don't know what this means. Um, we've gotten used to looking at these charts and we can usually pretty quickly tell if something doesn't look right. Um, so in this case, um, same chart as on the previous one, but for a different time slice. And you can see a chunk there uh, towards the middle uh, where there's a bunch of red that pops up, uh, meaning we're getting a bunch of errors. Um, the 90% uh, response times have spiked. Um, you can't, probably can't see it out there, but about two minutes. So it really means you're getting a bunch of timeouts. And then the uh, um, error response chart, you see that the red line has spiked up a bit there. So we're getting a lot more um, errors that we don't uh, like to see. And this, this again is uh, for the proxy. I should have pointed out even on the last dashboard, all these dashboards we can look at individual microservices. So if you're interested in particular the catalog or the dashboard or uh, any of the other apps in our system, uh, we can look individually at those. So it's one thing to kind of see there's been a problem. Um, as I mentioned before, root cause analysis is pretty important. Um, to be able to actually go and, and see what the problem was and, and fix it or, or find another uh, expert um, on another team to try and fix it. Um, we can, uh, so, so from these dashboards, we can uh, dive into deeper detail. Um, we can bring up some other dashboards that show us more information. Um, this, this chart, um, so one of the things our, our app that stores stuff to InfluxDB does is try to categorize um, the URLs that it sees. Um, you know, maybe a, uh, a Cloud Foundry call, maybe to the container service, maybe UAA. Um, so it tries to basically tag each URL. So then we can build charts like this, and I've, <laughs> I've blurred out the legend uh, so as to not uh, uh, implicate any <laughs> specific components. Um, but basically, and you probably have a tough time seeing it, I thought, hoped it would render a little bit bigger, but um, these first 15 or so um, categories, if you look at the legend, the max uh, time has been two minutes. Um, so it's really a pretty widespread set of uh, components that are returning, uh, uh, you know, that are timing out in this case. So, it, so from this, we would tend to think it's a more uh, systemic problem rather than, you know, one of our individual microservices. Um, sometimes when we start to see these problems, uh, the category, you know, we also categorize calls to our individual microservices. So we might see, for example, the catalog microservice um, pop up to the top of this category chart. And that gives us then someplace else to drill down uh, deeper to. <coughs> we also have the ability 
you know, we look at Grafana and we see those top, top level categories, um, but sometimes you need even a deeper level of detail. So we do have uh, another little app that will pull all of the request data and put it into a tabular format um, that you can look at. And these, these are some calls over, I think through the proxy over some uh, 24 hour period. Um, you can see the, the category on the far uh, left hand side, um, the target, which means which uh, endpoint, which host is the request going to, uh, the HTTP method, the status, um, the URL path um, that was used, the number of times it was called, um, and then you know av total time is really the average time, and you get min and max and those sorts of things. So, um, and then you can also drill down. You know, the, these are all hyperlinks. If you use our little UI for this, you can drill down deeper and see see all the individual requests rather than having them grouped together with timestamps and you know the stats for each individual request. And you can also get um, some additional um, statistics like. Uh, the 95% time and standard deviation. Because um, sometimes, again, we'll see requests that look pretty good, but they uh, you know, have these spikes, so the 95% time is, is higher than we like. Or we have a, we have a wider variance than we like. Um, <laughs> wall of shame. So, so one thing, too, we, you know, we want to improve over time. Um, so we've started to what I affectionately call walls of shame, um, where we can use that details view from the previous chart and you know, do things like show the 10 slowest APIs across the system. Um, you can set count, you know, set count thresholds, so maybe you know, I care about APIs that have been called 1,000 times over the last 24 hours. You know, what are the 10 slowest? Um, you can also uh, do filter by like errors, so you want to see which you know, APIs have returned the most errors in the last, uh, you know, X number of hours. So, so we're using that to try to um, get, you know, send this out to teams regularly and, uh, uh, you know, get some pressure, I guess, to, you know, I, I use shame, I put it in quotes, because, you know, we're all in it together. Um, but I think, you know, the goal for your team would be to not have your uh, API show up on the wall of shame. Um, we're also interested in uh, uh, memory and CPU usage crashes. Um, this chart shows, um, so we do all this monitoring for all of our dev and staging and uh, production systems. Um, so I guess that's also an important lesson maybe to point out that it is, you wanna see how things are doing um, in your dev and test before you actually uh, promote to production. And, and this was actually an example where we found this last the last chart on here, these are Node.js apps, mind you, um, oops, is CPU usage. So normally in a, in a Node app, you'd expect very low CPU usage, um, especially for one that you are using to serve UIs. Um, and you can see the uh, CPU usage is just steadily going up um, until later um, in this time period where we put in a fix and it went back down to what it should be. So we found this. Um, in development, so this um, bug causing the CPU usage never got out um, to production. So I'll talk a little bit about if you want to use some of these principles yourself. Um, I'd actually planned on um, publishing some of the code that uh, we use to uh, publish um, these metrics, um, but uh, a couple weeks ago I, I learned about uh, a project that's actually been developed by IBM <laughs> called At Metrics. It's an open source project. I think Mike uh, mentioned it in his uh, presentation yesterday. Um, it shares a fair amount in common uh, with uh, the middleware I mentioned earlier that we put into all of our microservices, um, but it goes even deeper um, to provide additional metrics. So, so if you wanted to build a system like this, I'd recommend uh, taking a look at this open source package um, in, in the slide deck. There is a link, sorry, notification from Lotus Notes. And uh, well, it just sort of proves again that, to me that IBM is a big play. So we sometimes have many people working on similar problems in slightly different ways. 
But you know what I think we'll probably end up doing is using app metrics for our middleware, um, but, but because it also sends data to MQTT, um, a lot of some of the other things we do where we write to InfluxDB or do some analysis and alerts, um, we should be able to build um, those systems um, using um, the app metrics module because we can just um, subscribe to MQTT and do some of our own um, data uh, massaging and storage. And this is just a table of some of the additional things that app metrics can look at for you. So if you're using uh, socket IO, for example, and you want to see, see metrics on your web sockets, um, that's included in app metrics, as well as uh, a number of databases and things that if you're interacting with Cloudant, actually I don't think Cloudant is on the list, but MongoDB, um, and you want to see details about the queries you're doing and such, um, app metrics is uh, capable of doing that. Um, it can be configured to store um, data into Elasticsearch or StatsD. Um, we kind of like InfluxDB in what we've been doing and the connection to Grafana. Um, I've talked to uh, uh, the development team about possibly adding that adapter. Of course, it's open source, so I could probably uh, <laughs> contribute that as well. And I just want to, so all the data we've talked about, sorry, all the data we've talked about so far is really focused on the server side. So I did want to give a quick uh, mention that we also do some synthetic data collection where we have strips running outside of the product uh, using SiteSpeed IO, um, which is an open, another open source tool um, that will actually load your web pages and give you all sorts of information about uh, page load time, uh, first, uh, f the time to first show anything on the page, um, you know, your DOM complete time, number of requests on the page, very detailed information you can get. Um, we, we run these strips and store the data in Graphite and have built, again, more Grafana dashboards um, to look at this um, Graphite data. So we think this is important because you know, some of our, the response times I mentioned earlier, again, our server side, um, there's networking and appliances between um, your server side and the browser. Um, so it's also good to get a sense of you know, how long those uh, hops are taking, um, as well as uh, sort of testing from uh, different geolocations around the world. So we can run these strips from different VMs. Um, if you're familiar with web page test, um, SiteSpeed.io will also allow you to um, invoke web page test, which you can uh, do from different spots in the world. So, so we have a sense of how long things are taking uh, to connect to our server from Australia versus um, from South America, for example. We have some of that information, which you can't really get from just the server side metrics I mentioned before. And that sort of takes us to the end. Um, any questions? Yep, go ahead. Where do you collect all the data that's coming into and from? Are these from firewalls, nozzle kind of input? That, that we put, that gets into MQTT? Yeah, so we've got a piece of middleware in all of our node apps. Um, so that when, my, and these are express node apps, so we've got some express middleware that when a request comes in to a microservice, the middleware sees, oh, we've got a request, and it fires the data um, to, so that it's published to MQTT. So, so basically each app is, um, and MQTT is a very lightweight protocol. Um, they actually have a, you know, when you, when you install the module, there's C code behind the scenes, so you can really do a, a fire and forget, because we didn't, <laughs> we didn't want metric collection to slow down um, our actual microservices. So, so I guess the fire hose is just each individual app um, so sending events to MQTT. Any other questions? Yep. Did you find that that wall of change was actually very effective? Did you see I'd say it's been mixed so far. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, especially in a company like IBM, and I'm sure there's other you know, big companies represented here. It's like everyone seems to have kind of their own priorities. Um, so you can approach a group and say, well, you know, this API isn't performing like we need it to for the UI to perform. And, you know, so sometimes uh, 
Uh, some groups are more uh, receptive to that than others. Um, so, I, so I think it's still a, a work in progress to figure out the best way to drive um, changes and best practices across a wider organization. I mean, you could also, you know, we could also do the opposite experiment where you uh, have a wall of pride, I guess, where you put the, put the best performing APIs and things like that up there too to also give some positive feedback. Um, but we haven't quite done that yet. Okay, any other questions? If not, thanks very much, Tony. Thank you.